So we have um, um, we have two papers today. One is uh, a meta analysis on the diagnostic uh, accuracy uh, of CMR to identify correctly identify cardiac transplant rejection. And it's an honor and a pleasure to have Balaji Tamarapu uh, here uh, with us. Um, he is uh, with the Department of Imaging uh, at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And um, this paper is actually, uh, I find very important because for years, if not decades, we have talked about um, transplant rejection and the use utility of CMR, specifically T2. And uh, uh, while I had followed the literature, there was so much evidence that it works. Actually, it somehow got neglected by many. And I had the feeling that it would need uh, some energy here um, to uh, first collect the data, evaluate what we are having, and then provide the information that will uh, eventually inform guidelines and recommendations. And that's why I was very uh, happy seeing that paper coming and out of also of a very competent uh, uh, site. And so it's a pleasure to have you here, Balaji, and uh, present uh, the paper published in, uh, in JAK, uh, Cardiovascular Imaging, which is called Diagnostic Accuracy of CMR for Cardiac Transplant Rejection in Meta-Analysis. Uh, I will probably spay later on myself talk a little bit about the other paper, but uh, today we want to uh, have our strongest focus on, on this one. So uh, feel free to, to take 15 or 20 minutes for, for everything, maybe 15 minutes presentation so that we have some time to discuss. Okay, so go ahead and take it from here. Brilliant. Um, Matthias, thank you very much for extending this invitation. Um, I wasn't even aware of such a journal club, so this is wonderful <laughs> for me to uh, start plugging in. And uh, by the way, I just recently moved um, to Indiana University to the Cardiovascular Institute there uh, to work uh, okay. under the leadership of uh, Subha Raman um, no, to nice. expand uh, <clears throat> our cardiac CT and MRI program here in Indianapolis. Yeah. So, uh, that's that's fantastic. Good to hear. Uh, Suba is uh, definitely excellent to work with. So I'm very happy for for you. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so because yeah, you may not have joined a lot of the journal clubs before. So this is a very informal one. We 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 specifically do not wa want this formula go slide by slide. Really have the authors themselves walk through the paper through the PDF go to the key salient points, uh, the takeaways, and, and describe them from their perspective, and then open up the floor for some uh, questions, so. Wonderful. Um, so I did a little bit of homework before, uh, because it feels like this was ages ago when I worked on this manuscript. Um, but the uh, basic interest in this field is, as uh, Matthias mentioned, there are not a lot of multi-center studies in the field of a cardiovascular transplantation, specifically looking at what are the imaging correlates that we can use to diagnose rejection. Because most of the way um, the transplant surgeons have been doing this is by bringing in the patient every few months, uh, getting a myocardial biopsy, and then if they get Acutely ill, the patients always get a myocardial biopsy. And many centers, at least from my experience at Cedars, um, shy away from the use of CMR because they're concerned about the use of contrast in a patient who may already be facing potential um, renal um, issues. So this becomes very important to identify very nice CMR-based um, markers, which will be contrast-free, where we can actually look at uh, possible rejection. So I just marked that 12.6% of patients experience rejection within the first year of transplantation. So that's quite an important um, issue. And then, as I mentioned here on my shared screen, the accuracy of endomyocardial biopsy is very limited because you know, you're taking little pieces of tissue from an extremely large field. So what, um, prior to this, 
uh, one of the uh, research fellows at uh, Cedars, Rob Miller, um, and I were working on looking at just the Cedars data, looking for um, T1 and T2 thresholds that might indicate what um, you know, is going on in the myocardium. And we, of course, were overambitious in trying to understand, can we differentiate between um, cell-mediated rejection versus antibody-mediated rejection versus biopsy-negative rejection. So that was our, what started all of this. So we decided, given the paucity of data in this field, that we should take all of the studies that have been done um, and try to do a meta-analysis, trying to understand, are there very highly accurate markers using CMR that will tell us when a person is having rejection. So the criteria we used was that the manuscript that we were looking at had to be either a diagnostic or case controlled study. It should have adults that underwent transplantation. And because most of us in various uh, centers are using 1.5 or three Tesla magnets, it should have been done on one of those two. And then there should have been some myocardial tissue characterization um, along with measurement of T1, T2, ECV, or LGE. And um, that endomyocardial biopsy would have to be used as a reference standard. And we should also have enough data where we can construct a two by two diagnostic table without having to actually pull primary data from various uh, centers. So that was um, how we structured the um, data collection. And as you will see, I put a little marker here to remind um, myself to tell you guys that of the 319 um, and 159 records that we got from independent sources, uh, we had 478. And at the end, um, when you look at the studies that fulfilled all of the criteria, we had 10 studies. So this should already tell you, as Matthias mentioned, we need a lot more um, interest in this field to kind of push the envelope a little farther. So this shows you the number of studies that actually measured these indices. So once again, relatively small, and this makes meta-analysis so much more complicated because even small heterogeneities can then you know, uh, influence your data uh, when you do the pool, pooled estimates and having a larger sample size would have been a much nicer thing. So this already starts giving you an idea of the limitations of our approach. So the way we did this was to look at estimated sensitivity and specificity as forest plots. We also looked at a hierarchical modeling based summary uh, receive, receiver operating characteristic curve, or you can call it by its uh, acronym, HSROC. Um, this is a very common method that's used in meta-analyses because with meta-analyses, you're taking studies that have been done by different centers with different patient cohorts. And a lot of times in medical diagnostic imaging, what we're doing is we're using some kind of quantitative parameter, and then we are actually using a cutoff for that parameter. So based on where you use your cutoffs, your sensitivity and specificity can be very different. And therefore, and the accuracy of the test can be different. So it's nice to use an HS rock curve that kind of gives you a summary line of the statistics so you can more easily understand the variability in the various sensitivities and specificities. And then you can also for yourself create a um, AUC curve of sorts. So um, the next um, shared screen shows you the study design. All of these were single center prospective studies. And you can see once again, the number of patients um, who had rejection were relatively small. You know, these are unlike many of the other cardiovascular trials where, you know, thousands of patients are enrolled. These are, you know, less than 100 patients per site. And then you can see that there is some variability in terms of time of the CMR from the time of you know, the graft. Um, so these are in years, 
and you can see that you know there is some variability there. Nice to know that most of the ages of these patients were relatively similar, and uh, this tells you what the patient population looked like. And then we also have a summary of the scanners that were used, 1.5 or 3 Tesla, um, and then the parameters that were measured. Um, as you can see, not all of them measured all the parameters. There, you know, um, some have more parameters than the others, but for the most part, there were five that uh, specifically measured T2 um, times. There were five that measured the T1, and then there were some that actually looked at ECV. And I, if I remember correctly, I think there were uh, four of them that measured ECV values. And um, you can see that the number percent of sample with rejection is you know, off these patients. Um, this, the nice thing about it is because not every patient had rejection, you can actually get very good diagnostic uh, summaries from each of these, but once again, you know, because we are using um, biopsy, there is the concern that there might be some patients who you are missing um, as truly having a rejection that does impose a limitation. So more importantly, the results, um, this, these are forest plots, so these give you pooled sensitivities and specificities. Sensitivity is here on this panel, specificity is here. And so, for example, for T1, the sensitivity was 0.85 and specificity was 0.7. For T2, nicely, um, sensitivity and specificity are quite high. And I will show you that for example, ECV, the sensitivity is very high, but you know, we are left with much lower specificities and LGE really doesn't perform as well in terms of sensitivities and specificities um, for diagnosing rejection. And um, so that is summarized in the meta-analysis results um, table here. And then, the more important thing that, at least for me, as somebody who doesn't do statistical analysis for a living, is the use of this. So, for example, this here is going to be your um, hierarchical modeling of the T1s. And the number of open circles here tells you the number of studies that actually measure T1. So you see that there were four studies that measure T1. And if you were to look at the AUC of the pooled data from all of these studies, this is your um, area under the curve or the you know, ROC curve. And this region here that is marked really gives you the sort of confidence interval of your estimates of the um, AUC and the under the ROC curve. So you can see, for example, look at the really large area under this um, curve, which tells you there's significant heterogeneity between these studies, which could be imposed by, you know, within the study heterogeneity and then between study heterogeneity. The nice thing is we at least have one piece of uh, one parameter that we can kind of cling on to, which is the T2, where, you know, it's actually quite nice that in meta-analyses, this is more common of a phenomenon. And this is actually quite acceptable in terms of sensitivity and specificity. And you can see that the summary characteristics are summarized here. And um, so for example, for um, you know, the ECV here, there were four studies. For LGE, there were once again four studies, uh, sorry, five studies that showed you so this is really not very good because it's almost a 50%, um, you know, sort of like toss of the coin uh, probability of finding a positive LGE versus a negative LGE in a patient who's truly having rejection. So this is really not acceptable at all. Um, and ECV is not performing that well. The AUC, the ROC curve is 0.78. So if I were to give you a take-home message, I would say 
that T1 and T2 seem to be the more robust indices. And even among them, the T2 value is probably the most robust. We did actually go ahead and try to get a pooled T2 threshold that would give us the best diagnosis. And we found that a T2 of around, if I remember correctly, I think it was 54.75 because previous studies, um, I know I marked it somewhere here, um, but the T2 of 50, essentially you could say 55 milliseconds uh, was really the cutoff point that seemed to uh, give us the best um, you know, performance across all of these various studies. So in summary, I would say that, um, and then of course I told you the limitations, you know, there are, there is heterogeneity in the population and within the samples, um, the various studies used different cutoffs, which tells you why the sensitivity and specificity is very heterogeneous. And then uh, the number of studies included is small, and therefore, there is a lot of bias within this. And also, you have to remember there, it's all, there is something called publication bias, which is a problem with meta-analyses, where if you don't publish negative results, you're not going to be able to use those data. So that's also a part of this. But this really is the uh, take-home message where essentially T1 and T2 seem to be performing the best in terms of diagnostic uh, value or diagnostic uh, characteristics in this. So um, I'll stop here and uh, I can take your questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for um, providing a, a nice and, and, and concise and informative overview of this very important analysis. So what, what uh, I like about that is that first, um, to me, at least the, the results that you summarized here seem uh, pretty consistent. Um, so that is always a, a good sign. Uh, it also, from my point of view, matches our expectations in terms of the, the underlying pathophysiology. Um, and maybe the most important uh, that uh, it points to the ability of a non-contrast technique uh, to provide this information in a patient population that would need a lot of scanning. I remember the times when we uh, did research on, on transplant rejection and, um, and uh, there were some, some patients who received 10, 15 uh, scans with gadolinium uh, and as you, as you also showed here, we were a little bit disappointed by uh, late enhancement, although I, I, I sort of was not necessarily totally surprised because late enhancement is, is really just more in showing the more severe irreversible type of injury. Uh, it's, it's a replacement fibrosis that we can typically visualize and, 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 and not so much the more global, sometimes more subtle effect of, of early transplant re rejection. And um, given um, this data here, um, and I don't know how much more, that would be my question, how much more do you think we need to actually take uh, the leap and say, you know what, let's put that into guidelines and recommendations and just let's not do all these biopsies all the time when we really are not even sure how good they are. So before I uh, also, uh, everybody, whoever has question, feel free to post it into the chat or just uh, uh, speak up uh, and we'll come to your question, uh, Otila, in, in a second. So what do you think, how much more do we need uh, in order to make this kind of official here? <laughs> um, so, you know, the one issue with um, this study, as I told you, I mean, I feel quite comfortable just from my own experience at one center, which is Cedar sinai looking at rejection and using T2 as a marker, uh, that I definitely think T2 is sort of standing the test of time as being a good reliable marker of rejection. Um, the you know, issue is, can we even make it 
better with combining T2 along with T1. So you get more parameters that can then be added to some kind of calculation score or like a risk score uh, to then say, yes, this is doubly uh, you know, important. Um, I think that would be my one thing if we could develop more because we have, and I'm sure most of you have seen that when you see these biopsy uh, positive you know, uh, rejection cases, there are perturbations in T1 as well. I mean, it's not isolated to just a T2 value. So I, I wish we had like a combination of parameters where you could plug in certain features and it um, you know, more reliably predicts. But I think the problem is going to be that we don't have enough data you know, of, for example, you know, T1 values done on a 1.5 T with a Shmali or a Mali, and, you know, having all of those heterogeneities um, sort of being controlled, I think that would be my next step would be to say, if multiple centers decided to <clears throat> do something prospective using very standardized acquisitions across all centers. So all of these heterogeneity issues are controlled and then yeah. we come up with a score. So I'm being, I guess, a little more conservative in that respect. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. So, but, but you think a prospective multi-center uh, approach uh, with clear criteria um, and involving those centers who are experts in this field, uh, it would be the next necessary step. I would love to see something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, I okay. think, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. There's a question from Ottila Tot from uh, Budapest um, regarding the, the heterogeneity of the, the T1 and uh, also the standardized uh, approach to T2. Um, so, um, he, he says that um, the mollies have, I mean, we all know that the standardization of mapping has some, some issues. How do you see that? Um, how critically um, may this affect uh, the results in, in, uh, in, in this context? Yeah, so I think that is uh, one of the issues. And I was that, so when we started doing this, we were thinking because of the heterogeneity between scanners and even within, you know, the same magnetic uh, uh, 1.5 or TT, various scanners with their differences in MOLLE uh, times, perhaps ECV would be a better marker because you're somehow, you know, it's a ratio of these T1 times that will hopefully equalize yeah. things, yeah. but we, interestingly did not find ECV to be <laughs> better than T1. So uh, we, yeah. I almost wonder if there's going to be a range of T1 times that will be normal and a very like binary cutoff of T1 might not be the best mm -hmm. strategy, which once again, I think speaks yeah. to why we might need a combination of T1 right and a T2 to then say what is going on. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, and well, then we'll have to uh, move on in the interest of time. Um, but I agree with you. I think there is a lot of potential in not just blindfolding ourselves to any other uh, contextual data, but uh, include uh, T1 information and T2 information. We, we always tend to focus on that single parameter that tells us all, but a good clinician will take a lot of information uh, into a decision. And the, that's the same we should do with the rich information we can get from a, a CMR scan. So that's why there are also, uh, let's say there are also first results of combining these values. We have looked at that in the context of um, cardiomyopathy and myocarditis. And, and we have seen that the combination T1 and T2 definitely adds. And then there's the cine too. So mm -hmm. just study to understand then how does, how could the motion, how could strain be involved in a kind of an automated quantitative way to add to the information. So there's definitely more to come, but, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, for now, probably T2 is probably the best we have if we would have to pick one. And your meta-analysis provides exceptionally important uh, evidence for that. And uh, thank you very much for that research and, uh, and for the presentation today. Um, 
And so we only will have a few minutes, but that's totally fine because this is more something I wanted to, to, to share um, as uh, just food for thought. And then I will hand over to, to my co-host Bettina Bessler uh, from Germany to then uh, talk about the next uh, journal club. So this paper was published in, the, in European Radiology and it's not on cardiac MR, but I thought it's still, uh, I thought still it is interesting because we, we always talk about a contrast enhanced MR and it's certainly very important and, and a lot of diseases need a contrast uh, application, but there have been concerns uh, about uh, the accumulation of gadolinium in the brain. Um, so I, I personally was never that much concerned about NSF because if you give a regular dose of especially the newer generation contrast agent, that's not really an issue. Um, but the, the accumulation of um, the various gadolinium compounds in the brain, of course, especially in younger people, if that stays for longer, that may be an issue. So this paper adds to that a little bit. What they did is they uh, uh, scanned 100 uh, women with an increase of risk of uh, breast cancer. Um, and uh, those were kind of routine scans and they got repeated scans. So they looked at, at a cross-sectional design. So just that's one limitation was that this is not a longitudinal follow-up, which of course takes a lot of effort, but a cross-sectional design where they, where they looked at how do uh, T1 and T2 uh, relate or correlate with age and with uh, the administration of gadolinium in the history of these people. So they had various, and I will not go into detail, various anatomical uh, regions in the brain that, um, that they uh, used to, to assess T1 and T2. They used fairly standard protocols and uh, the mean age was about uh, 42. And uh, it was uh, roughly about three months after the last gadolinium exposure. And uh, they had pretty high doses. So the cumulative dose was 120 milliliters and uh, a mean of eight doses. So that's, that's quite a bit. That's not what uh, most other people uh, get. And uh, the, the uh, results uh, were, and they used uh, standard uh, methods, uh, statistical methods, univariable, uh, but also multivariable uh, and analyses. So I think that was, that was done fairly well or very well, as, as far as I can tell, not being a, st a statistician. So what they showed was that uh, the markers change with the age and do so slightly differently when people were exposed uh, to uh, gadolinium. So in, in short, with increasing age, you have a slight decrease of T2, a slight increase of R2 star as a marker for uh, T2 star, if you will. Whereas T1 was not that significantly involved, but if at all, well, there was a slight decrease depending on which method you use. So the look locker showed with age a slight decrease. So there are some age dependent changes with a reduction of T2 over time and a, a reduction of T1. Again, these are cross-sectional data. These are not basically longitudinal data in the same individual, but across uh, the different age groups. Now, when people had gadolinium, uh, that was uh, slightly uh, different. And uh, so um, what, what was most striking was that in, in, in some aspects, so the R2 star increase, so um, that would be in, in the widest sense, a, a bold effect was basically blunted or absent in, in patients who had uh, gadolinium, the same for T2. Uh, so that was not that uh, present, whereas the, the decline of T1 in some um, uh, in, in, in the T1 mapping techniques uh, was obvious, uh, that was not obvious before. So uh, what, what, does that, what does that mean? That means that first there are changes over time, apparently in women, uh, so women of different age groups have different T1 and uh, T2, but not so much T1, sorry, for, but mostly uh, T2. And that this is uh, also confounded by 
uh, gadolinium administration. Now, why is that? And one, of course, one, one uh, possible reason the, the authors do not discuss, which is interesting from my point of view, or what I'd like to uh, ask them, uh, is that what's the role of the water content? We know that over age, the water content of tissue changes, so that would also explain a, a reduction in T2. But they uh, provide some uh, an interesting discussion on the impact of certain metals, specifically iron, copper, and zinc, uh, that show, and depending on age, uh, changes of their concentration that could also explain the, the changes. But then more importantly, for our context is that the administration of uh, gadolinium uh, has an impact. So the more gadolinium people had up to three months before the actual scan here, uh, the more, uh, the, more the, the parameters were changed in a sense that what you would expect from gadolinium. So this is another small piece of evidence adding to the, the, the knowledge that some gadolinium may stay in some regions. Now, this is so small that you cannot visually appreciate it. So that's what they also say. And it's probably even, even difficult to otherwise show that in, in an individual, uh, how, whether that happens or, or not and how important that is. On the other, and, and plus, we do not have any clinical evidence for any lasting clinically uh, detectable side effects from that accumulation. So I don't think it's time to raise red flags here, but certainly to keep an eye on that. We will need more data, but this adds a small piece of additional evidence. So that's all I wanted to briefly show about this paper and uh, feel free to download it from, from our website. So with that, I want to hand over to Bettina, uh, who's calling from Germany, right? Uh, not from Switzerland as last time, and yeah. uh, we'll talk about the next uh, time. So you also changed location, so this be, seems to be a mobile time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. So take it from here, yeah. Thank you, Matthias. So very interesting papers today, as usual. Um, so yeah, I'm back to Germany and I'm located in Würzburg uh, now. So hello from Würzburg. And I'd like to announce the next uh, CMA Journal Club, which will take place at November 3rd. Um, and we have two very interesting papers related to AI. So this is some of my major interests. Um, and especially the fusion of AI and cardiac imaging. And we have one paper um, dealing with acceleration in cardiac MR using deep learning. And it's a validation study in children and young adults using a, a novel type free breathing accelerated sequence. Um, I think it's a very interesting study which comes from Stanford and um, even Zucker will present his paper. And um, then we have a second paper um, from Boston um, on deep strain, which is sort of a um, automated deep learning workflow for um, functional um, analysis of cardiac MR. Um, also very interesting. And Manuel Morales, um, who's also on the uh, call today, hi, um, will present the paper. And I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, see you on November 3rd. And with that, I hand over to Matthias again. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks everybody for joining um, and for, uh, for, for, the, for the presentation. And uh, I hope to see you all back uh, together when Bettina hosts the next one in, in November. And uh, yeah, have a good day, good evening, wherever you are. And see you soon and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.